Uh, it says an American Airlines 727 with 80 persons aboard landed safely today at Washington's Dulles International Airport after a small bomb exploded in a mail pouch in the cargo hold. I lifted up the top of the box. Zap! I uh, basically blew a large divot out of my arm, ripped my hand open, blew off my fingers and everything. And I saw the door open and all of a sudden a big explosion. It was really big, and then all of a sudden I saw him stagger out and fall down on the ground. Thus we've developed the code name Unabomber to refer to the bomber, and Unibomb to refer to the investigation. They have targeted professors and individuals associated with airlines or aircraft production. It was the most expensive investigation in the history of the FBI. And no, all set with anger and revenge, try not to get blown up. <laughs> The killer called the Unabomber has terrorized this country for nearly 18 years now. In addition to killing three people, his attacks have wounded 23 others, some seriously. The FBI believes it has a strong suspect because he fits their profile in so many ways. Ted Kaczynski, better known as the Unabomber, has left a lasting soot stain on the fabric of 20th century America. He was a certified genius, anarchist, neo-Luddite hermit with antisocial tendencies and ideas that he felt were important enough to kill for. And in the end, he took three lives and maimed many more for his ideals. He operated his reign of terror undetected from a tiny isolated cabin in the Montana woods for more than 17 years. All while his crimes elevated panic amongst the public, became noteworthy in the news cycle, and required more resources than any federal case in history. Those of you who were around in the 70s, 80s, and 90s are more than likely to recognize this sketch. Or maybe you read through Industrial Society and its future, Ted's lengthy and meandering manifesto that spoke on saving humanity's freedom by ridding the world of the industrial ills of society. Technology over-socialization, science marching on for its own sake without regard for how it would affect humankind. Those of you too young to remember his warnings are likely living through the consequences that he predicted while being none the wiser. But how does a math prodigy with so much potential mature into an antisocial serial killer and domestic terrorist with a vendetta against tech and those who progressed and propagated its potential? And how did he manage so much carnage for so long? without detection. To get an idea, we have to start at the beginning. He's like another Einstein. Well, maybe not another Einstein, but and I said, what do you mean not another Einstein? <laughs> Theodore Kaczynski Jr., or Ted, was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1942 to two loving Polish-American parents, Theodore and Wanda Kaczynski. In his first several months of life, Ted was a happy, curious, and energetic infant. But at nine months old, he came down with a bad case of the hives. He was taken to the emergency room and treated for a few days. In those days, they did not allow you to stay with the child. I would remember how he'd grab the bars of the crib in this hospital, and he'd scream and hold out his arms and I'd have to go out the door. When I finally came back to take him home, what they handed to me was not this bouncing, joyous baby, but a little rag doll that didn't look at me, that was slumped over, was completely limp. Later, Ted's mother would come to believe that this infant trauma could have been the start of his ultimate withdrawal. When Ted was seven, the Kaczynski family would grow once more when his younger brother David was born. As he and his brother grew up, their home life was stable and healthy. David looks back on his early years with Ted fondly. He recalled later that when he was three years old, he couldn't reach a door handle in the house. So his older brother Ted improvised a contraption that would allow him to open the door using a spool of thread. Ted's dad was an outgoing and active father who encouraged his boys to think for themselves and to consider the larger questions in life. He enjoyed the outdoors, and nearly every weekend, he would take Ted and David out to the woods outside of Chicago to go camping and canoeing. David would later say that some of the happiest experiences of his life were these with Ted, 
outdoors, a release from the confinements of various kinds. Growing up, I never doubted my brother's fundamental loyalty or love, or felt the slightest insecurity in his presence, he would also say. And I remember one time when we were throwing that ball, we were as far apart as we could we could get and still reach each other with the ball. We were throwing that ball as hard as we could, as far as we could. Of course, the ball was thrown very inaccurately because we were trying so hard to throw it. And so we, would, we were making these running, leaping catches. We made more fantastic catches that day than, than I think we did in all the rest of our years together. That was more fun. Still, even at a young age, David could tell that something about Ted was just different than other people. It was something he and others probably just chalked up to Ted's extreme intelligence, as there was no doubt that he was uniquely gifted. By fifth grade, Ted's proficiency in science and mathematics were already becoming evident enough that he was given an IQ test that came back with a score of 167. Ted's parents were encouraged by the school staff to let him skip the sixth grade. Ted's mother was worried about the change, but only wanted what was best for her son, hoping it would keep him from becoming bored in school. The change would start to desync him emotionally from his peers. He was not involved in any extracurricular activities except for math club and a period of trombone lessons. It was also around this time that he began to withdraw noticeably from those around him, and when he did interact socially, he was a bit of a prankster. Because Ted was woefully ignorant of social norms and lacking self-awareness, it came off as pompous, cruel, and narcissistic. One time, when Ted was still a child, his mother had just cooked a family dinner and was bringing it to the table. Ted pulled out her chair as she went to sit, causing his mother to collapse on the floor and spilling the plate of hot food everywhere, while he laughed about the mess he had made. An early classmate of his named Joanne Young recalls the time that he played a prank on her in chemistry class. He had twisted up a piece of paper, cupping the ends. He put a few drops of ammonia on one side and iodine in the other. He gave Joanne the contraption and told her to untwist the metal. When she did, the chemicals ran together, causing the contraption to harmlessly explode with a small pot. Ted laughed, but Joanne did not find it funny, telling him that he would be suspended for it. No, I'm not. I'm too smart, he said. Still, others would have more fond memories of Ted and his pranks. To be fair, pranks were fairly common at Evergreen High School. They threw firecrackers and made smoke bombs for fun. President of the math club, Patrick Morris, looks back on his memories with Ted in a more positive light. The thing that runs through my mind is how young he was, how juvenile he was in the best sense and worst sense of the word. At a social level, he was not traveling at the same rate as the rest of us. We did trade around bomb recipes. We put together some stuff and set it off. Gunpowder is easy to make. There are some easy recipes you can make out of stuff from your medicine cabinet. He also recalls a time that another student asked Ted for advice on how to give his prank a little more punch. Ted obliged. The dumb kid went ahead and he did it. Hit it up with a hammer. It blew out two windows in the chemistry lab. These stories are a fun reminder of how kids used to be able to be kids. They're also a haunting foreshadowing of Ted's life to come and a perfect representation of his arrogance, even at such a young age. His odd behavior was also noticed at home. His mother said that when Ted was scared, something that was brought on by anything from new people coming around to large buildings, he would go to his shutdown place, where he would internalize and not talk to anybody around him. Younger brother David took notice. I, I actually asked Mom, Mom, what's wrong with Teddy? And you know, Mom's saying, what, what do you mean? There's nothing wrong with Teddy. What are you talking about? And I said, well, he doesn't have any friends. I mean, why? Mom always faulted the hospital. They would have been there every day visiting him. But the hospital said no. At the tail end of that conversation, she said, you know, Ted may have felt abandoned as a little baby. Don't ever abandon your brother, David, because that's what he fears the most. And of course, I'm thinking, well, I'll never abandon Ted. Why would I abandon Ted? I love Ted. Ted would go on to skip the 11th grade, despite regularly cutting class, and he graduated high school at just 15 years old. At 16, he accepted a scholarship to Harvard University and started his freshman year of college at 17. His childhood was not a typical one, because Ted was not a typical child. After his eventual arrest, he would attempt to paint his childhood as a traumatizing one that would catalyze his mental illness and set the course for his explosive future. 
In a letter written by Ted as an adult, he blamed his mother for his social incompetence, calling her a dog. In another letter to his parents, Ted wrote, I can't wait until you die so I can spit on your corpse. It's his feelings about our family bear no relationship to the reality of the family life that we experienced. These were loving, supportive parents. And by all other accounts, including neighbors, classmates, and extended family, his home life was a loving and supportive one. Ted's antisocial behavior was probably the result of both nature and nurture, a mix of unavoidable biological factors and the effects of life experiences explain his inability to properly interface with the world around him. Nature being the fact that Ted was probably somewhere on the spectrum, you know the one. This would be a blessing and a curse, something that held him back socially while also fostering an extraordinary academic performance. His accelerated education thrust him into settings where his peers outflanked him in age and maturity, inevitably setting him up to be socially ill-adjusted and isolated. The nurture end of things probably stems from his traumatic time at the hospital like his mother believes. His time at Harvard is probably also a contributing factor, where he participated in MK Ultra experiments that played a large role in altering the way Ted thought about the world around him. In 1958, 17-year-old Ted moved nearly a thousand miles away from home to start studying mathematics at Harvard. He was a maladjusted, reclusive teen who had a hard time making friends. He cared very little about adhering to the unspoken social contract that binds society together, notably the importance of hygiene. He quickly became known around his dorm as the student with the grossest room. Many people have vivid memories of it smelling like spoiled milk and foot powder. While his interactions were few, he did manage to cross paths with a man named Henry Murray. Murray was a psychologist and educator who was a pioneer in the development of personal theory, something associated with both brainwashing and interrogation. Murray offered the young, naive Kaczynski a little cash to participate in a study that he would be conducting in the psychology department, and Ted obliged. Murray's study was widely reported to be part of the CIA program codenamed Project MKUltra, but with many of the records being restricted or destroyed in 1973, it cannot be confirmed outright. What we do know for sure is that Murray worked with the OSS, which later would become the CIA, during World War II doing studies into how much recruits could withstand interrogation and design programs to break down their personalities. We know he was an advisor during the LSD experiments with Timothy Leary. We know that from the fall of 1959 through the spring of 1962, Harvard psychologist in the Department of Social Relations, led by Henry Murray, conducted a disturbing and what would now be seen as ethically indefensible experiment on 22 undergraduates, one of which was 17-year-old Ted Kaczynski. And finally, we know that the CIA funneled $456,000 to 13 Harvard programs with unnamed professors in the departments of psychology, philosophy, and social relations between 1960 and 1966. So can we say that Ted was the subject of MK Ultra experimentation? No, but of course he was. What are you, stupid? The Harvard study included asking the participants to write essays explaining their worldviews. The participants would then come in for mock interviews under harsh lights and staring into a one-way mirror, a setting intentionally designed to maximize stress and distress. Their essays would then be used against the subjects by interrogators on the other side of the mirror to assault their ideas, beliefs, and egos in a verbal ambush. Murray called the attacks vehement, sweeping, and personally abusive. Ted was made to face himself, and his deepest beliefs were broken down. The trials were recorded so that after, the participants could be made to watch their breakdown again from a different perspective. The techniques developed during these years would later be used to attempt to cure serial killers and hardened criminals in the 1970s and 80s. Prolonged sessions of personality corrosion that served to destroy the subject's desires, motivations, and core beliefs would hypothetically leave the mind vulnerable to a sort of rewiring, brainwashing to some, rehabilitation to others. Why don't we see this revolutionary work in our prisons today, you may ask? Well, because it just didn't work. And in fact, it made many of the criminal subjects more violent and unpredictable. Curiously, in a letter written by Ted around this time, Kaczynski told his younger brother David something interesting. I have a good deal of anger in me, and there are lots of people I'd like to hurt. 
The reason I've never committed any crime is that I have been successfully brainwashed by society. The experiments continued throughout Ted's time at Harvard, and there's a good chance that the personality deprogramming done in Murray's trials would unlock the anger and rage that Ted would ultimately need to become the Unabomber. During that same time, Ted was flying through his coursework with unprecedented ease. He graduated Harvard at 20 years old, completing his mathematics degree in just three years. Regarding Ted's thesis, one of his professors on the dissertation committee said that he guessed maybe 10 or 12 men in the entire country could understand or appreciate it. Interestingly, when it came out decades later that the Unabomber Kaczynski was a part of these experiments, Harvard immediately sealed all records. After Harvard, Kaczynski went on to earn a PhD in mathematics in 1967 at the University of Michigan. That same year, 23-year-old Ted moved to Berkeley to teach at the University of California, where he taught undergrad geometry and calculus. Berkeley and Harvard were both crawling with protests while he attended, being some of the hotbeds of civil rights activism. Despite having such strong beliefs later in life, Ted did not participate. He probably felt that these people were fighting for the wrong cause, and his politics just didn't line up. His politics, as they seemed, were more personal. Ted taught for two years at Berkeley, and during this time, he got consistent bad reviews from his students. His inability to make personal connections made him disconnected from most students. Unless they showed the promise and focus that he had in the classroom, he didn't have the energy to drag them along. In 1969, Ted was growing tired of the system, and he resigned from Berkeley without explanation. Mathematics was just a game, and I wasn't satisfied spending my life playing a game. Second place, I wanted to get out of the system and out into the wilderness. In his manifesto, Kaczynski likened science to a surrogate activity that is directed towards an artificial goal that people set up for themselves merely in order to have some goal to work towards, or some sense of fulfillment. Scientists work mainly for the fulfillment they get out of the work itself. Thus, science marches on blindly, without regard to the real welfare of the human race or to any other standard obedient only to the psychological needs of the scientists and of the government officials and corporation executives who provide the funds for research. By this point in his life, Ted was decidedly anti-technology and becoming alarmingly antisocial. He was ready to move to the woods and isolate himself from the world that he was growing increasingly aggrieved with. After a couple failed real estate deals, Ted found a spot that would suit his needs. He bought a plot of land a couple miles south of Lincoln, Montana, well off the beaten path. He, with the help of his brother David, constructed a shabby 10 by 14 foot cabin in the woods. The shelter had no running water, no electricity, and no municipal amenities, but it was exactly what Ted wanted. He would live there without installing any of these basic needs from 1970 until his eventual capture in 1996. He loved living off the grid and spending time in nature without the modern distractions that were becoming so prevalent in the world around him. But little did he know, that modern development and industry that he had seeked to avoid were on his way to him. He spent a lot of time reading survival books to improve his wilderness skills and journaling about his grievances with the industrialized world. When he would be eventually captured, authorities would find a whopping 30,000 pages of journal entries, a third of which were in a mathematical code that the FBI and CIA would describe as being as complex as the code used in the World War II Enigma machine. Ted wrote about how industry and science marching forward would strip away individuality from the people and inevitably lead to a technocratic dictatorship. His withdrawal from the system was his own personal protest and a way to separate himself from the creeping dystopia. He liked his isolation and his privacy, even when it came to his family. And as we were driving up his, uh, his road, he was driving out the other way. We all waved at him, said, Ted, hi. And he, again, he had that, that veiled look on his face and he kind of held up his hand and looked away and just drove off. We ended up returning to my apartment in Great Falls and found Ted sitting there on the couch. Um, this would have probably been early afternoon and he remained sitting there um, until nightfall. Uh, he in the would not shutdown spook. state. In the shutdown state. On many days, Ted would hike deep into the wilderness to be alone with his thoughts and had found what he considered to be his favorite spot to reflect and journal. One day while making his way out there, he ran across the unthinkable. 
he arrived to see that the entire area had been cleared of trees, and the spot that he sat by himself so many times before was now a paved road. This act of betrayal pushed Ted over a line that there would be no coming back from. His own withdrawal from the system would no longer be enough. He now felt an obligation to wake up the world around him and help free them from the slow boil of systematic slavery that they were unknowingly walking into. He was now going to take down the techno-industrial system by inspiring fear in the institutions that made it up. You just can't imagine how upset I was. It was from that point on I decided that rather than trying to acquire further wilderness skills, I would work on getting back at the system revenge. That wasn't the first time I ever did any monkey wrenching, but at that point, that sort of thing became a priority for me. I certainly don't claim to be an altruist or to be acting for the good, the good, whatever that is, of the human race. I act merely from a desire for revenge. In another journal entry, Ted is quick to separate himself from all the nature do-gooders. I believe in nothing. So, oh, I don't even believe in the cult of nature, worshippers or wilderness worshippers. I am perfectly ready to litter in parts of the woods that are of no use to me. I often throw cans in loft over areas or in places much frequented by people. I don't find wilderness particularly healthy physically. I don't hesitate to poach. Ted popped his cherry of societal defiance locally. Along the road that he would ride his bike into town was a lumber mill that had been noisily chugging away since he first moved into the area. He had never been a fan of the noise pollution that it made or the way it profited off of the destruction of nature, but now he was mad enough to act. One night he snuck in and attempted to sabotage all of the machinery there at the property. It was less effective than he would have liked, and the operation was back up and running in no time, but it scratched that itch and he wanted more. Ted had also taken a disliking to the people who came to town to ride dirt bikes through his peaceful woods. The next time he heard them zipping through, he went to the cabin that they were staying at, smashed a hole through one of the walls, and took a steaming shit right in their tub. He would be questioned by authorities later about this, and he knew that he needed to go further away from home if he was going to keep up his antics. Still, he was excited about what he'd accomplished, and he wanted to up his game, make a real splash. He began spending time making guns from scratch and picked back up his childhood hobby of making explosives. Ted began to build up the confidence that he would need to begin his reign of terror. He was more than capable of making a device that would hurt somebody, but he was more focused on not being caught. Much of his time went into making untraceable components, like wooden housings, switches made of hickory, batteries with all the labels scraped off, and repurposed nails that could not be traced. He knew these precautions would work against the effectiveness of the device, but he also knew he could improve the bombs over time with trial and error. Even being without so many things that we all take for granted, Ted was resourceful and found ways to make his life work for him. He would ride his bike into town if he ever needed supplies or new reading materials. Even though he was reclusive, he was cordial enough to develop sordid relationships with those living around him, namely along the route that he rode his bike into Lincoln. And this may have just been because they were curious enough to engage with him, but he would use the associations to his advantage. He would often pick through his neighbor's junk piles to gather the odds and ends that he would need to work on his projects. Scrap metal, wire, useless clutter that nobody would notice had gone missing. They have quite a large boneyard with everything that anybody could need to do pretty much everything. There's hundreds and hundreds of feet of every kind of color and gauge of wire and you're not gonna miss something like that. Did I suspect Ted of taking stuff? No. If you use any common sense at all, your chance of getting caught are practically zero. But there's nobody there to see you. The only, the only danger is if you talk to somebody else and tell them what you're doing, and they don't keep their mouth shut. And he'd just go and help himself to whatever parts and pieces he needed to make his bombs, and it was like, he didn't even think he was doing anything wrong. Still, as resourceful as he was, he found himself coming up short from time to time, despite his mother sending him regular infusions of cash to assist with his unorthodox lifestyle. Ted considered using his beautiful mind in any typical career as feeding into the system that he was now obsessed with dismantling. 
but his mission would require compromise, and from time to time Ted would travel to work odd jobs saving cash for a few months at a time before retreating back to his cabin. One notable example of this was in the late 70s when he traveled back to Chicago to take advantage of an opportunity his family had arranged. They had gotten him work at the foam rubber factory where his brother David was a foreman and his dad was a manager. No one knew he would bring his rage and one of his devices with him and use his trip to Chicago as the perfect chance to try out his first bomb. It would prove to be a clumsy attempt as most of our first times are. He had built a mail bomb with the intention of dropping it off at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. But when he arrived to drop it off, he realized that his device was too big to fit in the mailbox. So he quickly decided on plan B, which was just leaving it there in the parking lot and hoping somebody would deal with it. The return address read Buckley Christ, a material engineering professor there at Northwestern University. And it was supposedly being sent to a polytechnic institute in Troy, New York. Instead of being mailed out, however, some good Samaritan there on campus found it and returned it to the sender. And when the package arrived at Buckley Christ's office on May 25th, 1978, Buckley was immediately suspicious as he did not recognize the handwriting on the return address, which he had supposedly written, so he called a security guard to deal with it. When campus police officer Terry Marker observed the package, he made a joke that I'm sure was much funnier then than 30 seconds later. He cracked wise to Professor Christ that maybe it's a bomb. As he peeled back the packaging, his own punchline erupted in his face. But he was lucky because the attack proved to be underwhelming. Terry Marker only sustained minor cuts and burns when the bomb exploded. When the U.S. Postal Service investigated the incident, they were unable to come up with any leads. We know old Teddy today as the Unabomber, but at the time, the USPS dubbed him the Junkyard Bomber. Ted treated his first mail bomb experience as a set it and forget it, and he didn't look back on the results. And this may have been because he was preoccupied by something else going on. He never had a huge interest in women during his time in academia, but when he made a personal connection with a supervisor while working at the foam rubber factory, he thought, what the hell? Ted, despite his quirks, seemed like a decent man, on paper at least. He was somewhat handsome, well-educated, and a lover of nature, but his almost inhuman personality and aversion to basic hygiene proved to be big stinky hurdles to overcome. Ted still took his swing, and somehow he managed to get a few dates out of the woman, one which even ended with a kiss. It was a profound and exciting experience for Ted, as evident by one of his many journal entries from the time. As mentioned in some of my notes, I did make an attempt with a bomb whether successful or not, I don't know. During the last few weeks, I was too busy thinking about it, but this affair with has done strange things to me. In the first place, it aroused in me hope, a hope for something worthwhile. Perhaps foolishly, I did hope that I might win, if not her love, it's a reasonable amount of affection, physical sex too, of course, but it would have been more important to me to have her care for me than to have physical sex with her. I could get by with just holding her hand if necessary if I thought she really cared for me. But as it turned out, she didn't even want to hold Ted's dirty hand, and she quickly put the kibosh on the whole situation, claiming that they just didn't have enough in common. Ted did not take this rejection well, and he lashed out like an immature schoolboy. As it turned out, the relationship didn't go anywhere. He wrote a limerick that was offensive, and he pasted it in various places around the factory where we worked. About her? About, about this woman who had rejected him. I approached him and I, I told him um, in an angry way that he had to stop doing that, and if he did it, I would fire him. Um, the next day, he came up to the machine where I was working and pasted one of these limericks right in front of me and said to me, so what are you going to do about this? I said, Ted, go home. Ted's behavior had gotten himself fired by his own younger brother, no less. Furious at the woman and the situation, he decided that he would wait in her car the next day until she got off work. He wanted to kill her, but sitting there waiting, he rethought his actions and decided that he had bigger fish to fry. Sure, he could kill her, but what would that do in the grand scheme of things? 
He decided to leave the foam rubber life behind and head back to his cabin so he could make a real impact on the world. Once Ted got back to Montana and settled into his cabin, he probably traveled into town at some point and did some research to see if there was any news on his first attempt. He was surely let down to know it barely injured anyone, and to make matters worse, he'd been dubbed the Junkyard Bomber. The reason it had gone so poorly was a series of junkyard design choices that he made for his 9-inch pipe bomb. First, the metal pipe had been capped with hand-carved wooden plugs. Typically, one would use threaded steel pipe caps that would allow the pressure inside to grow into a much more violent eruption. Next, the trigger mechanism was a nail tensioned with a rubber band that would swing across a set of six match heads upon his hand-carved wooden box being opened. This would ignite a set of six match heads upon his hand-carved wooden box being opened, which would ignite the explosive, a very inefficient design compared to just using a battery and a heat filament. Last was his choice of explosive material, which was smokeless explosive powder or black powder, which doesn't pack the punch that other explosives one could cook up would. Since Ted built the device shortly before traveling to Chicago for work, odds are that much of this was due to Mommy not sending him enough hobo allowance so he could just run to the hardware shop and get what he needed, so he ended up just using what he had laying around. That, or he was going for a more form over function, quirky, artisanal pipe bomb that you might find on Etsy. Either way, he took his time to make improvements in his design, upgrading the trigger mechanism to a battery filament wire that could reliably ignite the device. He also scraped hundreds of match heads off to add to his gunpowder pipe bomb. He packaged the entire device inside a wooden box and added the Phillies Blunt label to it, making it look like an innocent cigar box. It had now been nearly a year since his first attempt, and he felt ready to give it another go. Ted caught a Greyhound bus back to the Chicago area. Once again, he would target the Northwestern University in Evanston. But after the embarrassing mailbox mishap last time, he decided to leave the Postal Service out of the equation altogether. Once on campus, he walked into the Technological Institute building, walked up to the second floor, and into the empty study space in room 2415. He set his shady cigar box down on a counter and left, knowing somebody would eventually be curious enough to fall victim. A few days later, on May 9th, 1979, that curious cat would be graduate student John Harris. Upon opening the box, it erupted in his hands. Kind of. Um, there was a cigar box on the table outside my office. I picked it up, intending to put some pens and pencils inside. It turned out to be a bomb, which did not explode. It had a detonator that went off. I saw a bright flash. I don't remember hearing anything. The couple improvements that Ted had made created a bigger blast from the detonator but it was still largely ineffective as a bomb. Harris was treated at a hospital, suffering only superficial cuts and burns. When investigators inspected the debris, they found components made of wires, lamp cord, fishing line, wooden dowels, and friction tape. They and the newspaper saw it for what it was, another amateur bombing cherry rigged together with junk, and it failed to make national news. But even if it had, Ted would have a hard time finding that out. There was no internet news at the time, and he certainly didn't have cable or newspapers coming to his cabin. Either way, he decided that next time he was aiming higher, hoping to turn one bomb into many victims and set off a nationwide wave of panic. To pull this off, he was going to try and take a plane out of the sky, and just six months after his second attempt, he put this into action. He rigged up a device that would trigger with the use of a barometer, took it on a bus to Chicago, and mailed his package to Washington, D.C. via airmail. Once the barometer would hit 35,000 feet, or cruising altitude, the bomb was set to erupt. The unlucky plane to carry the package was an American Airlines 727 Flight 444, a passenger plane flying from Chicago to D.C. on November 15, 1979. It departed at 1025 that morning. At the tail end of the flight, the barometer triggered, and a muffled explosion in the hold of the plane was heard by the pilot and all of the passengers. Fortunately for everybody on board, the bomb, like the others so far, proved to be a massive failure. The explosion failed to breach the hull. In fact, most of the powder didn't even erupt. Instead, it smoldered until it began to fill the cabin with green smoke. 
oxygen mass dropped from above the passengers, and a panic broke out. The pilot initiated an emergency landing at Dulles International Airport in Virginia. After the plane landed safely, 12 people were hospitalized for smoke inhalation, but nobody was injured. That being said, according to the authorities, if the bomb had been better built, it would have been horrific and likely would have taken the entire airliner right out of the sky. Regardless of the results, Ted's work was now a national news story. Attempting to take down an airplane attracted a lot of three-letter agency attention. The FBI and the ATF came in to assist the U.S. Postal Inspection Service in the investigation. Unfortunately, agency dick swinging prevented the groups from sharing information as everybody wanted to take credit for the bust. They had not yet linked the two bombs at Northwestern University to this one, but in time, the connection would be made. But as things stood at the time, they were no closer to arresting Ted for any of his crimes. In fact, they would make little progress at all for the next 15 years. All Wallace bomb making methods would only improve and his notoriety and victim count would steadily grow. Ted was not done targeting the airline industry, but he decided to approach it a little differently. Instead of using a box that he made, Ted hollowed out an old book that when opened would activate a pipe bomb within. He also chose to leave a type of signature that would mark all of his remaining work. The letters FC punched into a piece of metal. Only he would know at the time, but it stood for Freedom Club. For Ted, this was a fun little red herring for investigators that would allude to a potential terrorist group being responsible. About seven months after his attack on American Airlines 444, Ted was happy with what he put together, and he decided to target the Lake Forest, Illinois home of 60-year-old United Airlines President Percy Wood. First, he sent a letter allegedly from a Mr. Enoch Fisher of Lake Forest that arrived on June 3, 1980. It read, Dear Mr. Wood, I am sending copies of Ice Brothers by Sloan Wilson to a number of prominent people in the Chicago area because I believe this book should be read by all who make important decisions affecting the public welfare. Ted's hope was that this would prime Mr. Wood for receiving a package and prevent him from being suspicious of the arrival. And he turned out to be right. A week later, on June 10th, Percy Wood received a special copy of Ice Brothers, just as he was expecting. What he wasn't expecting, however, was when he opened the front cover of the book for the pipe bomb buried within the hollowed pages to explode. Ted's work was improving, and the bomb went off exactly as intended, sending large amounts of wooden and metal shrapnel deep into the left side of Wood's body. He was rushed to the hospital and into surgery to remove the large piece of metal that was embedded in his left leg as well as smaller wooden and metal pieces embedded in his left hand and the left side of his face. He was treated for burns as well, but the doctor said that he would suffer no permanent damage, though plastic surgery may be needed. This attack would be the first time that investigators began to put together some useful information. When the FBI got a look at the remains of the bomb, the FC signature was a curious and confusing find, but a new clue nonetheless. Besides that oddity, the physical similarities to the American Airlines bomb were clear, and once again the victim was tied to the airline industry. They also noticed similarities to the two bombs at Northwestern University, including the homemade initiator, sloppy soldering work, and the use of low quality wooden components. And it was these junkyard bomber qualities that led to the four cases being brought under one investigation. The Unibom, or University and Airline Bomber Task Force, was now starting to understand they were up against a serial bomber. Some of the most impressive work done by the disjointed task force at the time was done by Postal Inspector Tony Mulyat. He'd been brought on during the American Airline case and started to notice some odd patterns. For instance, he noticed several references to the words wood and green were piling up. All these bombs had strange wooden components, and the last one was sent to a Mr. Wood. The phony return address on this latest one was to Ravenwood Street, and the bomb was concealed in a book published by Arbor House, whose logo was a leaf. The return and recipient addresses on the outside of the package were written in green ink, which reminded Moyot of something odd that he noticed on the American Airlines bombing. When the gunpowder used in that bomb was analyzed, they noticed that it was mixed with barium nitrate, a powder compound that's found in many fireworks. Mulyat wondered at the time why it was included in the mixture, because it has no explosive qualities, and is only used in fireworks to color the smoke green. The clever postal inspector was starting to think that the bomber was leaving clues, but about what, he couldn't be sure yet. It was about this time that the FBI's newly formed Behavioral Science Unit 
the inspiration for TV's Mind Hunter, came aboard to help compile a profile on the Unabomber. After looking over the little bit of evidence that had been gathered, they concluded that the suspect would have above average intelligence, connections to academia, and would be a Neo Luddite, which was fucking spot on. But as time passed without any suspects servicing that fell under that description, other profiles took priority and the FBI ultimately decided that they were looking for a blue collar airplane mechanic. 16 months would pass while investigators and Chicago area residents worried if there was another attack coming. Over time, tensions would settle and rumors began popping up that maybe the Unabomber had been arrested on other crimes. That, or one of his creations had blown his super intelligence through the back of his skull and straight out of the gene pool. But this was only wishful thinking because Ted was about to shake things up and strike where nobody was expecting. In early October of 1981, Ted shaved off 16 months worth of beard, trimmed his hair, and cleaned himself up a little bit. This had become a little routine before his attacks as a way to hide his identity. He'd go commit his crimes all cleaned up, and then return to his cabin and remain out of view for weeks or months at a time to build back up the gruff and layer of filth before letting himself be seen. So Ted, freshly scrubbed and bomb in hand, hopped aboard a Greyhound bus towards Utah. His destination was Salt Lake City, specifically the University of Utah campus. When he got there, he walked around a little bit until he found an inconspicuous location right outside the university mainframe room to leave it. It would sit there for several days until on October 8th, 1981, a cautious student would pick up the large package and feel that something was off. He immediately set it down and called in security who got the FBI and the bomb squad involved. The business building was evacuated while the bomb squad relocated the bomb to the women's restroom nearby and disarmed it. It was immediately apparent that the Unabomber was behind the Utah attempt by the FC signature on the device. The Unabomb task force, being able to take the bomb apart before it had exploded, would shed a lot more light onto how the bombs were being made. This one was a wooden box built around a pipe bomb and a tank of gasoline, and it would hurt nobody. It would be seven months before Ted would get out and strike again. He would sit through the snowy winter in his cabin, tinkering with new ideas and writing. Once the weather got nice again, he could go back out and test his winter's work. And in May of 1982, he did just that when he hopped on a bus with a package that he was happy with and got on the road. It would take him all the way to Provo, Utah, where Ted walked his package to mail it from the Brigham Young campus post office. He confidently dropped his package off and started his trip back home. The package was lucky it went anywhere, as it was mailed using canceled and insufficient postage. But somehow it made its way onward to Professor Patrick C. Fisher of Pennsylvania State University in northern Pennsylvania. But because Ted was gathering much of his information from outdated magazines and newspapers as a local town library, his information wasn't always the most up-to-date. Professor Fisher had actually relocated to Vanderbilt University in Nashville years ago, however. But lucky for Ted, somebody just forwarded it along. When it arrived at Vanderbilt University on May 5th, Professor Fisher was actually teaching in Puerto Rico. He did have a diligent secretary there in Nashville who was taking messages and collecting his mail, though. Janet Smith was truly unlucky to ever cross paths with it, but when she opened up that package, a fierce explosion filled the office. Shrapnel tore through her face and arms, and she was rushed to Vanderbilt Hospital where doctors were able to stop the heavy bleeding. The crime scene and all of the evidence was combed by investigators who spotted the metal FC signature and noticed that the package's alleged sender was named Leroy Wood Burnson from Brigham Young. A real and current professor there, yes, but he knew nothing of the package. They also saw that the Unabomber was still experimenting with his designs, as this one used a sink trap variation pipe with the classic Unabomber wooden end plugs. Probably with mixed feelings on the outcome of what had just happened, Kaczynski decided that he would just deliver the next one himself. And he wasted no time getting one ready, because just two months after his Vanderbilt bomb, Ted was riding that old bus line even further west. He got off in Berkeley and found a good place to leave his newest device on the University of California campus. On July 2nd, 1982, engineering professor Diogenes Angelakos entered a faculty lounge in Quarry Hall. It was a regular stop for mathematics and computer science staff. But laying invitingly there on the floor was some sort of handcrafted measuring device, he thought. He walked over and grabbed what he thought to be the hand grip and lifted. A 
blast rang out as the pipe bomb within sent shrapnel through Professor Angelakos' hand, arm, and face. His fingers had been shredded by the force of the blast and tendons decimated. There was also a large tank of gasoline that was intended to ignite a devastating fireball, but it failed to trigger due to bad design, something Professor Angelakos was both thankful for and amused by. The idiot filled the tank to the top and didn't leave enough air for the gasoline to explode. Investigators also found the remains of a typed note in the debris of the bomb blast. It read, Woo, it works. I told you it would. RV. After looking into the note, it was determined to be a red herring left by the Unabomber. It had been meant to implicate previous Berkeley colleagues, Hung Zai Wu and Robert Vaught. But the two were cleared of any involvement almost immediately, and the paper used for the note matched paper used in other Unabom cases. The Unabomber was now just messing with them. In 1983, the FBI made a dedicated 1-800 hotline number for the Unabomber Task Force to take tips, and over the years, they would receive thousands. Perhaps a bit spooked by the tip line, Ted waited nearly three years to strike again. He spent the time honing his skills in his Montana cabin, preparing to attack the Berkeley campus once again. As time passed, the investigation came to a crawl. They had compiled all they could on the case. They knew he used a manual typewriter, rubber stamps for marking postage as priority, and they knew with each new device came a higher level of sophistication and power. Investigators had surveillance set up in Salt Lake City and had put out a large reward for information. All they could do now was wait for him to strike again. In May of 1985, Ted traveled to the Berkeley campus once again with another gift for anybody curious to touch it. He had rigged a three-ring binder with a pipe bomb set to detonate upon opening. He walked into Quarry Hall, the same building that he'd visited three years previous, and left the binder in an empty computer lab. On May 15, 1985, an unlucky Air Force captain and graduate student named John Hauser would wander into that computer lab and notice the binder. The carnage from the binder bomb topped anything that Ted had caused so far. That! Threw my arm off to the side. Uh, really splayed it open quite a lot. So. Uh, basically blew a large divot out of my arm, ripped my hand open, blew off my fingers and everything. I also had my uh, Air Force Academy ring on my right ring finger. And when I, when I uh, opened the device, it blew my fingers and the ring off and left an imprint in the wall itself. Four of his fingers were completely destroyed and he lost most of the vision in his left eye. And he also suffered severe nerve damage. An artery in his arm is spewing blood as he screamed for help. It would be none other than the Unabomber's previous victim, Professor Diogenes Angelakis, that would come running to help, fashioning a tourniquet from his necktie as another onlooker called 911. Perhaps the most tragic loss for Hauser that day was his chance to fly the space shuttle. He had ambitions to be an astronaut and was on a short list of potential pilots that NASA would send to space, at least until that day he was. When investigators inspected what was left of the bomb, it was immediately cleared that the Unabomber was the culprit. The device had the now infamous FC stamped on the end seal of the pipe. It was also clear that he had made massive improvements in its design. The pipe bomb had metal caps, replacing the wooden ones that had been used up until now. The explosive medium had been upgraded from gunpowder and gasoline to a potent mix of ammonium nitrate and aluminum powder. The shrapnel used was a mix of tacks, lead chunks, and nails. Investigators knew that the Unabomber had been toying with them for the past seven years and they were no closer to catching him than they had been after the first attack. And with the devices becoming more and more deadly, they knew that it was only a matter of time before he managed to kill rather than maim. And with the erratic targets and timeline of attack thus far, no one knew when or where he would strike next. Little did they know, it had already been put into motion. Despite all the increased attention by investigators, it would be a couple savvy and attentive janitors that would thwart Ted's ninth bomb. On June 13, 1985, less than a month after his last attack, a pair of custodian workers from Boeing Aircraft Manufacturing Facility in Auburn, Washington, noticed something strange about a package that had been sitting at the receiving station at the facility for nearly a month. The package was not addressed to a specific person or department, but simply Boeing fabrication, which is probably why it hadn't been opened. They cautiously peeked inside, and in a stroke of luck, the package failed to explode due to the batteries corroding and drying up while it sat. The King County Bomb Squad was called, and Boeing Building 17-4 was evacuated. X-rays confirmed the presence of explosives, 
The bomb squad meticulously dismantled and cataloged each component, giving investigators their first clear look at Ted's new and improved designs. The FC logo found confirmed that it was the Unabomber. After studying the device, it was taken outside the facility and detonated using a counter charge. The postage on the package proved that it had been sent from Oakland, California, as the return address indicated. But investigators quickly determined that the sender, a company called Weiber Tool and Supply, was completely made up. They also concluded that it had been sent on May 8th. With Oakland being a mere 15 minute drive from Berkeley, this meant that it was sent at the same time the last bomb was dropped off at the University of California. The Unabomber was ramping up his attacks. Four months after the scare at Boeing, the Unabomber struck again, this time choosing to swivel his target back towards academia. On November 15, 1985, a textbook-sized package arrived at the Ann Arbor home of prominent University of Michigan psychology professor James McConnell. McConnell was a popular figure in psychology, particularly the field of behaviorism, and had made many media appearances over the years. Ted Kaczynski's journals and later manifesto would reveal his fiery hatred for the study stemming back to the experimentation that was done on him in the name of a similar science at Harvard. And this past trauma of his was likely the motivation for targeting Professor McConnell. Presumably research will continue to increase the effectiveness of psychological techniques for controlling human behavior. But we think it is unlikely that psychological techniques alone will be sufficient to adjust human beings to the kind of society that technology is created. Biological methods probably will have to be used. You have already mentioned the use of drugs in this connection. Neurology may provide other avenues for modifying the human mind. Genetic engineering of human beings is already beginning to occur in the form of gene therapy. And there is no reason to assume that such methods will not eventually be used to modify those aspects of the body that affect mental function. The package, apparently from Ralph Kloppenberg, a PhD candidate at the University of Utah, specializing in the history of science, came with a letter. It explained that within the package was his thesis and he urged him to read it. Request to read unsolicited materials from others in academia were nothing new for McConnell, so he seemingly had no reason to worry. His research assistant, a man named Nicholas Sweeno, read McConnell the letter before opening the package in curiosity. When he did so, a fiery blast shook the room. Shrapnel tore through his arm and torso as blood began pouring out onto the floor. The blast was loud enough to immediately deafen both McConnell and Sweeno, who started to struggle to communicate what they had just lived through, but it did not stop them from taking immediate action. Nicholas Sweeno was immediately rushed to the hospital alongside McConnell. Sweeno's injuries were bloody, but not permanent. It would, however, take him three months to regain his hearing. Unfortunately for McConnell, he suffered from partial hearing loss for the rest of his life. Ted Kaczynski would manage to get in one more attack in 1985. Less than a month after the bomb exploded in Ann Arbor, a new type of bomb would go off in a parking lot in Sacramento, California, targeting a new kind of victim. And it would be this, Ted's 11th attempt, that would finally take a life. Up until this point, the Unabomber had focused on academia and airlines related targets. But Ted had a new trick up his fraying, unwashed flannel sleeve. He was now directing his sights towards a small business that he felt was disseminating the treacherous tools of the technocracy. He once again hopped aboard a Greyhound with his concealed IED to embark on a cross-country voyage, this time to Sacramento. On December 11, 1985, Ted made his way on foot to Rentec Computer Rentals in the Century Plaza Shopping Center. He placed his device, disguised as a large plank of wood with nails sticking out of it, in the parking lot near the back entrance of the computer shop. As Hugh Scrutton, the owner of Rentec, was leaving for the day, he spotted the hazard. Worried it could damage one of his customers or employees' tires, he did the sensible thing and approached it to toss it out. Unfortunately, the Good Samaritan's decision would be his last. The moment he picked it up, the device detonated, blowing off most of his hand. Metal shrapnel ripped through Scrutton's body and penetrated his heart, killing him instantly. The man who lay dead in the parking lot was once a student at UC Berkeley at the same time that Ted was a professor there, and their paths had likely crossed before this fateful day. However, based on a journal entry of Ted's that would be found after his eventual arrest, this was just a coincidence. Experiment 97. December 11, 
1985, I planted a bomb disguise to look like a scrap of lumber behind Rentec Computer Store in Sacramento. According to the San Francisco Examiner, December 20, the operator of the store was killed. Blown to bits on December 12th. Excellent. Humane way to eliminate somebody. He probably never felt the thing. $25,000 reward offer, rather flattering. It wasn't luck that Ted's latest creation was his first to kill. It was easily the deadliest yet. The device was loaded with three 10-inch pipe bombs filled with a highly volatile mix of potassium sulfate, potassium chloride, ammonium nitrate, and aluminum powder. It was also loaded with sharpened chunks of metal and nails. Ted had even improved the trigger mechanism to ensure that it would erupt as soon as it was moved. As usual, his signature use of wood and the FC stamp were present, leaving investigators zero doubt that the new tricks were just that of an old dog, the Unabomber. But the Unabomber was now officially a killer, which meant the manhunt efforts would be escalated and the public awareness would be at an all-time high. And Ted knew things would be heating up, so on his bus trip home from Sacramento, during a stopover at one of the Greyhound stations, Ted scooped up a few loose hairs that he found in the bathroom. Knowing investigators would only get more meticulous, Ted decided that he would slip them in his next device to send his pursuers on a wild goose chase. His careful nature resulted in him sitting on his patsy pubes and laying low for more than a year to let the dust settle. But by February of 1987, Ted was ready to get back out there. Since he was finally able to kill with his last device, he figured only slight changes would need to be made this time around. He refined the retaining system for the end plugs of the pipes and adjusted the trigger mechanism to be slightly more sensitive. Other than that, it was the same package as the last. Once again, he would target a consumer computer shop, this time a place called Cam's Inc. in Salt Lake City, Utah. On the morning of February 20th, 1987, Ted's bus pulled into town. He got out and walked to the back parking lot of Cam's before setting down the device, again disguised as a nail-ridden block of wood in an empty parking lot spot. He made eye contact with the woman who had noticed him, but she didn't seem to care, so he simply slipped away from the scene. At 11 a.m., the VP of CAMS, a man named Gary Wright, pulled into the lot and noticed something in his parking space. He stopped short and put his car in park to go clear the obstruction. He walked up and attempted to kick it to the side, detonating the device with as much force as before. Fortunately for Gary Wright, his decision to kick the object instead of picking it up saved his life but just barely. Initially, he thought he'd been shot, but when he looked down, he saw that half of his pants had been torn away on the left side. He saw that his shoes were charred, and then he noticed that there were several holes in his body, leaking blood. The blast had severely damaged his left arm as well. Shrapnel had severed a nerve and damaged tendons, leaving the appendage dangling uncontrollably. Gary Wright would need three separate surgeries to reconstruct the nerves and tendons in his left arm and hand undergo extensive plastic surgery to his face, and needed to have hundreds of metal and wooden fragments removed from all over his body. For more than a decade, he was constantly removing even more pieces of shrapnel that continued to rise from below the surface of his skin. Since 1987, Kaczynski had operated out of sight, was careful to leave no clues, and even seemed to enjoy toying with those who sought to catch him. People he surely felt were beneath him and not smart enough to bring him to justice. But this time, he slipped up. A secretary standing outside of camps that morning witnessed a man in a hoodie and aviator sunglasses walk into the parking lot and set down a strange wooden object in a parking space. The two had made eye contact briefly before he walked off. She thought this was odd but went on about her day. It wasn't until the traumatic passing of events shortly after that she understood what exactly she'd seen. Even though she was on the other side of the parking lot when she'd witnessed the man, she agreed to work with a sketch artist to come up with a composite image of the infamous Unabomber. The information she could provide was incomplete, and we now know that the infamous sketch produced would be pretty inaccurate, but it gave investigators their first real hope in identifying their suspect. The sketch was distributed to news outlets nationwide and broadcast ad nauseum. All of America now had someone to be on the lookout for, and Ted knew it. Cautious by nature, Ted decided that he would take no risks, and he ceased his attacks for more than six years to let the manhunt enthusiasm and the public's paranoia die back down. During this hiatus, Ted's paranoia got the best of him. When Ted's father passed away in 1990, he decided he couldn't risk traveling back home to attend the funeral, and shortly after he came up with reasons to cut ties with the remainder of his family. 
In his mind, it was now Ted against the entire industrialized world, and that's exactly how he wanted it. In the six years that Ted went silent, there was plenty to keep the American mind occupied. The Black Monday stock market tank in 1987. The Berlin Wall falling in 1989. 1990 saw America go to war in Saudi Arabia in Operation Desert Shield and the following year, Operation Desert Storm in Kuwait. And in 1992, the Cold War officially came to an end. The fear of the infamous Unabomber had subsided in most Americans' minds, as well as many of the investigators, who were busy over the last six years, figuring nothing out. But in 1993, Ted decided to re-enter the chat, bringing with him bombs made with fresh inspiration and a renewed enthusiasm for chaos. It was in June of 1993 that he traveled across country once again from Montana to Sacramento to set up shop for his grand reopening. On June 18, 1993, Ted mailed out two similar shoebox-shaped devices, both with phony return addresses that led back to Cal State professors. The devices within were housed in a wooden box within a padded manila envelope. He also mailed out a letter to the New York Times. On June 22, the first of his packages arrived at its destination, the San Francisco home of University of California geneticist Dr. Charles Epstein. Epstein's daughter went outside to retrieve the volatile package and brought it in to her dad. After taking it into another room to open it, his life would change forever. A violent eruption of steel and wood shrapnel tore into his chest and face. The blast was powerful enough to immediately rip off three fingers and break his arm. Epstein's family immediately dialed 911 and emergency services rushed to the scene. He was taken to Marin General Hospital, and thanks to the fast actions of first responders and hospital staff, he managed to pull through. Before authorities could get an idea of what had happened, the second bomb would go off just two days later. The second bomb would go off on the opposite end of the country at the Yale University office of computer scientist Dr. David Galertner. He, like Dr. Epstein, opened it without suspicion. The blast was enormous and caused immediate chaos in the Yale school building. Smoke alarms and sprinklers triggered while frantic students and employees ran towards the blast to help or away towards safety. The brave souls who ran towards Dr. Galertner were met with the spine-chilling scene. Part of the doctor's hand had been completely eviscerated and he was bleeding from head to toe. The impact to his face had blinded him in one eye and he lost hearing in one ear immediately. Now operating on pure adrenaline and a keen survival instinct, Glertner somehow stumbled down five flights of stairs before making his way to the campus medical center, leaving a horrific trail of blood along the several block trek. When he arrived, he was nearly dead, but the staff managed to stabilize his vitals before rushing him to Yale New Haven Hospital for an emergency operation that would save his life. Soon after, a man presumed to be the Unabomber would call a separate hospital where Glertner's brother worked as a geneticist. When he picked up the phone, there were but three haunting words spoken from the other end. You are next. An empty threat, but a terrifying one, nonetheless. Thanks to his own will to live and the hard work of the hospital staff, David Galertner would survive his near-death experience, but he would be the last target of the Unabomber to do so. Later, he would reflect on why he was targeted at all. There are computer scientists far more distinguished than I. I don't even like computers very much. But the excitement that day was not over. While Galertner was having the holes in his body pulled and stitched back together, the assistant managing editor at the New York Times, a man named Warren Hogue, was opening a letter that would immediately call for the attention of the FBI. It was the first time the Unabomber communicated with anybody about his attacks. We are an anarchist group calling ourselves FC. Note that the postmark on this envelope precedes a newsworthy event that will happen about the time you receive this letter if nothing goes wrong. This will prove that we knew about the event in advance, so our claim of responsibility is truthful. Ask the FBI about FC. They have heard. We will give information about our goals at some future time. Right now, we only want to establish our identity and provide an identifying number that will ensure the authenticity of any future communications with us. Keep this number secret so that no one else can pretend to speak in our name. The identifier read like a social security number, so investigators looked into it. 
It belonged to a parolee who just so happened to have a large tattoo that read pure wood. When the investigators looked into him, he was quickly dismissed from suspicion. It is unknown how Ted was able to acquire a social security number of someone whose tattoos bared his wood calling card. But the whole thing would turn out to be a wild goose chase, meant to associate withheld knowledge of the attacks with false leads about some shadowy group called FC. The public and the media were demanding an update from the FBI's investigation. FBI Director William Sessions was on thin ice already, having been charged with ethical violations just six months earlier, and his lack of leadership had been on full display in the 1992 Ruby Ridge siege and the Waco debacle that had just ended months earlier. In response to the public outcry about the current Unabomber case, he set up a press conference in San Francisco. The appearance was just for show, as everyone left without any revelations about the ongoing investigation. Just a month later, on July 20th, President Clinton was forced to fire FBI Director Sessions when he refused to step down. Sessions would be replaced by U.S. District Court Judge Louis J. Free, who many hoped would breathe new life into the Bureau and the investigation on the Unabomber. But the symbolic gesture would do nothing to help the struggling investigation find any lead on the killer. Up until this point, the FBI, the ATF, and the U.S. Postal Inspectors had all been working on the Unabomber case from separate angles for more than a decade now. They each wanted to be the agency responsible for solving the case, and because of this, they were reluctant to share information and collaborate. Attorney General Janet Reno said enough is enough, and with the help of the new FBI director, they formed the Joint Unibomb Task Force, forcing the separate three-letter agencies to play nice. For almost a year and a half, the group worked together to find any leads they could as the bomber went quiet once again. Despite the newfound cooperation and camaraderie, by the time he struck again, they were no closer to solving the case. On December 10, 1994, an ad executive named Thomas Mosser in North Caldwell, New Jersey began flipping through the mail that had come in while he was out on a business trip. The most interesting of which was a large parcel from his previous employer, Burson Marsteller. He had since been promoted to executive VP of Burson Marsteller's parent company. Despite an obvious typo in the company's name on the return address, he figured they were all in the family, or he didn't notice or he didn't care. Thomas was curious about the well-wrapped package and he went into his kitchen to open it. The devastating eruption to follow was the Unabomber's most deadly that he'd ever created. It had been packaged with razor blades, metal chunks, and nails meant to disembowel and destroy his target, and that's exactly what happened. When the bomb erupted, the house shook with a thunderous force, and Thomas Mosser was killed immediately. When his wife ran over to see what had happened, there was a mist pouring from the kitchen doorway. When it dispersed enough to see into the kitchen, she stood before a waking nightmare. Her husband lay face up on the floor, his head barely clung to his torso, and his face was blackened by the heat of the explosion. His midsection had been completely torn open, and his hand was only connected to his fingers by torn shreds of flesh. Mosser's wife called 911 in vain to get an ambulance, but it was clear when they arrived that there was nothing that could be done. It was supposed to be the day my family picked out a Christmas tree the day we celebrated Tom's latest promotion. Instead, it was the day my husband was murdered. The day I had to tell the children daddy is dead. Investigators quickly noted the infamous FC logo found in the rubble. They also determined that the package had been sent from San Francisco about a week earlier. They also discovered shortly after that an environmental publication had wrongly accused Mosser of being the ad executive that helped Exxon Valdez rehabilitate their image after a tragic oil spill disaster. Sadly, it was these libelous accusations made by the publication that would lead to him being targeted and his death. About six months later, a bomb rocked the Muir building in Oklahoma City, causing part of the building to collapse and killing 168 people. The gut reaction by investigators was that the Unabomber was behind it but that was quickly dismissed once evidence pointed to Timothy McVeigh and he was captured and confessed. And there's a damn good chance that Ted Kaczynski was upset that somebody else was now the big bomber in the news. It must have been a huge kick to his ego. McVeigh's death count was enormous in one swift blow, while Ted had been busy building bombs for 17 years and only managed to kill a measly two people. It is unknown if it directly inspired Kaczynski to act again, but judging by the timing of his next attack, I think it's likely that he wanted to be the center of attention once again. Because the very next day, on April 20th, 
he mailed out another device from Oakland, California, the deadliest device he'd ever constructed. On April 24, 1995, the package arrived at the office of the California Forestry Association in Sacramento, California. It was addressed to William Dennison, the man who had stepped down from the president of the Timber Lobbyist Group just a year previously. A staffer in the office brought it to the acting president, a man named Gilbert Murray, who assumed that it was a business-related package and the sender was just working with old records. As the staffer handed it to Murray, they joked, pretty heavy, must be a bomb. A joke that would become painfully unfunny in just a few moments. As Murray pulled open the box, a shrapnel lace shockwave ripped through every object in the room with a magnitude of force greater than anything Kaczynski had made before. The furniture in the room was blown into pieces, debris pierced holes in every wall, and body parts were hurled in every direction. When the dust cleared, the badly mangled corpse of Gilbert Murray sat amongst the rubble. His face had been decimated and was completely unrecognizable. Murray died instantly. After killing two people in a row and three out of his last six targets, Ted now felt confident enough in his methods that if he reached out to the world, his message would have some power behind it. He spent very little time trying to interact with the people in his life, as few as they were. When he wasn't building bombs, testing them, or traveling far from home to send them out, Ted had been meticulously outlining his grievances with the new industrial world in a lengthy 35,000 word manifesto. On June 25, 1995, he mailed out five copies of this manifesto along with a letter for context to various publications, including the Washington Post and the New York Times. The letter, allegedly written by the FC Group, took full responsibility for Ted's crimes over the past 17 years. It explained the reasons behind the attacks and clarified that they only meant to harm university members who were in technical fields and that they don't have any desire to hurt professors who study archaeology, history, literature, or harmless stuff like that. The people we're out to get are the scientists and engineers, especially in critical fields like computers and genetics. The letter asked that the attached manifesto, which Ted had titled Industrial Society and Its Future, be published in full and distributed to a wide audience, and if it was, the FC Group would promise to desist from terrorist activity. Although the letter also made it clear that this did not include sabotage, which could include the destruction of property without hurting people. If the request was not met, Ted promised that the FC Group would continue killing in 90 days' time. The Unabomb Task Force barely had any time to contemplate what to do before, a few days later on June 28th, another letter from the Unabomber arrived at the San Francisco Chronicle saying the FC would blow up an airliner out of LAX in the next six days. The letter also included the first two digits of the identifying number meant to authenticate messages from FC. The government says there is a credible threat that a passenger jet may be bombed from a man the FBI calls the Unabomber. The letter prompted a heavy response from law enforcement on the ground at the airport. All mail routed through flights was halted. Many people slated to fly out of LAX that day demanded a refund for their ticket. Because of the very public threat, airliners were obliged to let customers change the date of their flights, free of charge. But before the six days threat could fully elapse, another letter would arrive at the New York Times from FC, saying that the planned airliner bombing was a hoax. Since the public has a short memory, we decided to play one last prank to remind them who we are. But no, we haven't tried to plant a bomb on an airline recently. With communication and threats therein increasing from the Unabomber, officials were still debating on how to handle the manifesto. They did not want to give in to the demands of a terrorist, but the document may lead to somebody identifying the author. While the task force and the mainstream newspapers twiddled their thumbs, the publisher of Penthouse Magazine, Bob Guccione, publicly offered to publish the manifesto. Word apparently got back to Ted because in another letter, he clarified that if only Penthouse published, then he would kill once more, but that would be it. After months of deliberation, the FBI advised the Washington Post and the New York Times to run the manifesto in hopes that somebody would recognize the writing or the philosophy of whoever had written it. The Post would be the paper who had the machinery needed to print the entire document as an add-in, so splitting the publishing cost with the New York Times, an estimated $30,000 or $40,000. The manifesto was printed and made public on September 19, 1998. To go through all of the nuanced ideas and rambling thoughts that Ted included in his manifesto would take an entire separate video, but there are some key points that stand out. Depending on your own political views, you may agree or disagree with his philosophies, 
but most people could agree that his ideas seem prophetic and far ahead of their time. I will keep the excerpts brief, but I encourage everybody to give the full industrial society and its future a read sometime. The leftist needs to believe in leftism. It plays a vital role in his psychological economy. His beliefs are not easily modified by logic or facts. The leftist hate science and rationality because they classify certain beliefs as true, set of false, superior, and other beliefs as false, scaled, inferior. The leftist feelings of inferiority run so deep that he cannot tolerate any classification of some things as successful or superior and other things as failed or inferior. Words like self-confidence, self-reliance, initiative, enterprise, optimism, etc. play a little role in the liberal and leftist vocabulary. The leftist is anti-individualistic, pro-collectivist. He wants society to solve everyone's problems for them. The leftist is antagonistic to the concept of competition because deep inside, he feels like a loser. Leftists prefer to give society the credit or blame for an individual's ability or lack of it. Thus, if a person is inferior, it is not his fault with societies because he has not been brought up properly. The conservatives are fools. They whine about the decay of traditional values, yet they enthusiastically support technological progress and economic growth. Apparently, it never occurs to them that you can't make rapid, drastic changes in the technology and the economy of a society without causing rapid changes in all other aspects of the society as well. And that such rapid changes inevitably break down traditional values. Over-socialization can lead to low self-esteem, a sense of powerlessness, defeatism, guilt, etc. One of the most important means by which our society socializes as children is by making them feel ashamed of behavior or speech that is contrary to society's expectations. If this is over non, or if a pre-alert child is especially susceptible to such feelings, he ends by feeling ashamed of himself divide human drives into three groups. One, those drives that can be satisfied with minimal effort. Two, those that can be satisfied but only at the cost of serious effort. Three, those that cannot be adequately satisfied no matter how much effort one makes. The power process is the process of satisfying the drive for the second group. The more drives there are in the third group, the more there is frustration, anger, eventually defeatism, depression, etc. Rim. In modern industrial society, natural human drives tend to be pushed into the first and third groups. And the second group tends to consist increasingly of artificially created drives. A third demeaning to fulfill one's need for the power process through surrogate activities or through identification with an organization rather than through pursuit of real goals. When people do not have to exert themselves to satisfy their physical needs, they often set up artificial goals for themselves. We use the term surrogate activity to designate an activity that is directed toward an artificial goal that people set up for themselves merely in order to have some goal to work toward, or let us say, merely for the sake of the fulfillment they get from pursuing the goal. Here's a rule of thumb for the identification of surrogate activities. Given a person who devotes much time and energy to the pursuit of goal X, ask yourself if if he had to devote most of his time and energy to satisfying his biological needs, and if that effort required him to use his physical and mental faculties in a varied and interesting way, would he be seriously deprived of because he did not attain goal X? If the answer is no, then a person's pursuit of goal X is a surrogate activity. In modern industrial society, only minimal effort is necessary to satisfy one's physical needs. It is enough to go through a training program to acquire some petty technical skill, then come to work on time and exert the very modest effort needed to hold the job. The only requirements are a moderate amount of intelligence and, most of all, simple obedience. 
science and technology provide them the most important examples of surrogate activities. To work mainly for the fulfillment they get out of the work itself. Thus, science marches on blindly without regard to the real welfare of the human race or any other standard, but we need it only to the psychological needs of the scientists and of the government officials and corporation executives who provide the funds for research. Industrial technological society cannot be reformed in such a way as to permit it from progressively narrowing the sphere of human freedom. By freedom, we mean an opportunity to go through the power process with real goals, not the artificial goals of surrogate activities, and without interference, manipulation, or supervision from anyone, especially from any large organization. Freedom means being in control, either as an individual or as a member of a small group of the life and death issues of one's existence. Food, clothing, shelter, and a defense against whatever threats there may be in one's environment. Freedom means having power. Not the power to control other people, but the power to control circumstances of one's own life. It is said that we live in a free society because we have a certain number of constitutionally guaranteed rights. But these are not as important as they seem. The degree of personal freedom that exists in a society is determined more by the economic, technological structure of society than by its laws or its forms of government. Consider, for example, um, freedom of the press. Um, the mass media are mostly under the control of large organizations that are integrated into this. Anyone who has a little money can have something printed or can distribute it on the internet or in some such way. But what he has to say will be swamped by the vast volume of material put out by the media. The techno wilds taking all of us on an utterly reckless ride into the unknown. Many people understand something of what technological progress is doing to us, yet take a passive attitude toward it because they think it is inevitable. But we don't think it is inevitable. We think it, it can be stopped the two main tasks for the present are to promote social stress and instability in industrial society and to develop and, and propagate an ideology that opposes technology and the industrial system. When the system becomes sufficiently stressed and unstable, a revolution against technology made it possible. We have no illusions about the feasibility of creating a new, ideal form of society. Our goal is only to destroy the existing form of society. The kind of revolution we have in mind will not necessarily involve an armed uprising against any government. It may or may not involve physical violence, but it will not be political revolution. Its focus will be on technology, economics, not politics. All over America, there were people racing to the newsstands to get their copy of the manifesto, studying through it either with morbid curiosity or with the motivation to identify the author and collect the now $1 million reward for identifying him. The FBI's hunch that somebody would recognize it turned out to be right, but it wasn't just any average Joe who would make the connection. Ted's brother, David Kaczynski, who had only heard the name the Unabomber when his 15th attack made the front page of his local paper, decided to read over the manifesto himself. His curiosity would turn to a terrifying suspicion when reading through it, as it felt very familiar to him. Ted and David had been estranged for some years now, following David's marriage, something Ted was jealous and hateful about. In years leading up to that, however, Ted would write his brother in rambling, unhinged letters about his hate for over-socialization, the technocracy, and the government. The more David read over the manifesto, the more he could see similarities in tone, subject, and writing style. He hoped that the similarities were all in his head. But as he continued reading, one line jumped off the page to him and hit home something fierce. You can't eat your cake and have it too. A reversal of the classic proverb, you can't have your cake and eat it too. This was something that he had only heard uttered by his mother, and consequently Ted, who inherited the clumsy saying from his own childhood. To David, this was confirmation of his worst fears, that his own brother, a man he looked up to for much of his life, had spent the past 17 years as a terrorist and a murderer. Still, he had to be sure. David and his wife Linda reached out to Susan Swanson, a lifetime friend of Linda and a private investigator. 
They asked her to look through some letters that David had received from a friend. David wanted her to use her sources and determine if the letters in the infamous manifesto had a shared author. Swanson conferred with linguist experts and criminal profilers, and the consensus was in. They were, in fact, more than likely written by the same person. After battling his conscience over what to do, David and his wife decided it was their moral obligation to reach out to the FBI, but they had the reservations. The FBI's recent blunders at Ruby Ridge and Waco had them worried for how they would react. David loved his brother and didn't want to see him shot in the head by a sniper or burnt alive in his home, so he asked that the matter be handled discreetly. He also wanted complete anonymity, because he knew this would be a betrayal to his brother, and the guilt he felt was crippling, especially if he were to be wrong. The damning information in David's request were passed along to the FBI through their attorney. The FBI was working with a profile of the bomber that frankly didn't match up with Ted, and with 2,416 other people on their suspect list, they couldn't commit their resources to Ted just yet. David then visited his mother's house to find other writings by Ted to compare. There, he found a 27-page proto-manifesto that Ted had written in 1972, which contained the same philosophies, grudges, and topics as the recently published manifesto. David sent the document to the FBI, who immediately knew this was the man that they were looking for. The FBI agreed to keep David's role confidential and began laying plans to take down the Unabomber before he struck again. They also agreed to go in soft like David requested, probably because they knew lights and sirens from the cavalry would just end in Ted blowing himself and any arresting officers to Timbuktu. The task force meticulously planned a careful manhunt that began with a stakeout. Hundreds of agents flooded the small town of Lincoln, Montana, disguised as anyone else who may be in town. Lumberjacks, prospectors, hikers, and tourists. The locals with a keen eye immediately spotted the change in population. Snowmobilers with too clean of gear, lumberjacks with brand new trucks. But Ted's reclusive life left him oblivious to the oddities, and his lack of close community relationships meant no one spoke to him about them either. The FBI kept a close eye on Ted's movements, or lack thereof. They hoped to be able to intercept any attempt at another attack or simply apprehend him when he went into town to grab supplies. Lookout posts, sniper dens, and electronic monitoring systems were all put into place. Satellites passing over charted the area and provided authorities with a detailed map of the surroundings. Ted was surrounded and being stalked by the techno-industrial system that he'd been working against this whole time. Still, days of waiting turned into weeks of disappointment and Ted remained in his cabin. The task force was growing impatient. To make matters worse, the fact that the investigation was closing in on a hermit in Lincoln had somehow leaked to CBS who was threatening to report the story. All of the efforts by the FBI would be for nothing if the community was suddenly flooded with news vans and reporters. Out of desperation, they decided to lean on neighbor Butch Gehring for help. They began by leveling with Butch, telling him that Ted was the infamous Unabomber, something that seemed unimaginable to Butch. Then they asked him to record Ted's cabin to get a better visual of the location. In addition, they asked him how, if he was them, how he would approach the cabin without inciting violence. Butch told the investigators that Ted was worried that his property line may be in conflict with government land, and this gave them an idea. On April 3, 1996, a couple FBI agents dressed as forestry workers approached Ted's cabin, holding a map. They knocked, and to their surprise, they were greeted by an unarmed Ted, who saw the encounter as a formality to a land dispute. But as soon as he stepped outside, he was grabbed and cuffed, and countless hidden agents flooded in from behind trees and over the hills. They were able to take Ted without incident before combing through the tiny cabin that was wall to wall with incriminating evidence. Ted refused outright to speak to authorities. Initially, it troubled investigators that Ted bore no resemblance to the infamous sketch of the Unabomber, but their worries were melted away when they found the hoodie and glasses that were described in the sketch. They also found a ready to be mailed bomb under Ted's bed and another in the construction phase. As if that were not enough, all of Ted's writing, including detailed logs of every attack, would be found as well. In total, over 700 individual pieces of evidence would be taken from the tiny cabin before the cabin itself was hauled away to former Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento, California. The Unabomber Task Force was now sure that they had their man, and their suspicion that the FC group was but a cover for a lone actor had been confirmed. In a careless betrayal of the man who solved their 17-year manhunt, the FBI leaked who the tipster was almost immediately. The whole world would know that it was the Unabomber's own brother, David Kaczynski, who brought him down. 
it's all public. And here's my mother, and she's got to go through this now. As soon as we get out the door, all the lights come on, and people are yelling at mom. They're saying, Mrs. Kaczynski, do you think your son's the Unabomber? And she answered, she said, I, I, I don't know. You people know more than I do, I think is what she said. Ted's own feelings about this would come out years later in an interview from a prison cell. If the roles had been reversed, if you would expect, if you had suspected David of being the Unabomber, right? After all the years that you haven't been communicating very regularly, what would you have done? I would have kept it to myself. Is that what you feel he should have done? Yeah. And what was the first... What was your reaction to that when you first hear that David is involved in turning you in? What does that feel like? Well, obviously I resented it. Um, <laughs> there, there was another, another strain to my feelings there. I don't know if I can explain it properly, but um, in, a, in a way I was almost glad because um, my own brother turning me in, in a sense, made me feel good. If David were to come visit you, if David's in the room now, what do you want to say to him? Nothing. I just wouldn't talk to him. I just turned my back and wouldn't talk to him. Yeah. Do you still love him? No. No. Now that authorities finally had Ted Kaczynski in custody, his fate would rest in the hands of the justice system. Ted, who was as arrogant as he was intelligent, disagreed vehemently with the tactics suggested by his defense. He was dead set on making his philosophy the star of the trial, while his lawyers wanted to question his sanity. Ted was sure of his sanity as well as his convictions and refused to undergo psychological evaluations. Their next best option was to challenge the search warrant used to gain access to the cabin and the damaging evidence within. On March 4th, 1997, they filed a motion for it to all be thrown out on the grounds that the FBI inflated David Kaczynski's suspicions that Ted was the Unabomber with him actually believing that he was the Unabomber. It was all accompanied by a sworn declaration from David that said just that. A month later, another motion was filed and the defense claimed false and misleading info was presented to a judge in order to obtain the warrant. On July 29th, 1997, Judge Burrell agreed to toss any evidence that came out of the cabin with the exception of Ted's journals. This essentially rendered the motion moot, as Ted's meticulous documentation of his own crimes were so damning that it could be taken down with those alone. On November 12th, the trial began. It took less than a week for the desperate defense team to go against their client's wishes and use an insanity angle to try to avoid the death penalty for Ted. The prosecution was quick to point out that Ted had refused a mental illness defense and in fact had been hostile to the idea. When Judge Burrell tried to convince Ted to just go through with the basic evaluation, he proved the prosecution's point by throwing a fit. He refused the evaluation and hurled a pen across the courtroom in anger. On January 5, 1998, Ted requested that the judge allow him to fire his defense team as they were not looking after his best interests and allow him to hire celebrity lawyer Tony Serra. After three days of deliberation, Judge Burrell denied the request and resumed the proceedings with the original defense team. But on January 8th, Ted again brought things to a halt when he requested to fire his defense once again, but represent himself in court. Judge Burrell used the opportunity to get the psychological evaluation Ted had been avoiding, saying he could represent himself if he proved himself competent to do so. It was also revealed that day that Ted had allegedly attempted to take his own life the night before by hanging himself using his underwear, something that, if true, proved he wasn't even competent to kill himself. On January 9th, Dr. Sally Johnson, resident psychiatrist at the Federal Correctional Facility in Butner, North Carolina, was assigned to give this evaluation. Her report was submitted on January 17, 1998. She had diagnosed Kaczynski as a paranoid schizophrenic. This made him prone to delusions and often violence. She concluded, however, that he was mentally competent to defend himself, so the trial continued. By January 22nd, both sides agreed that Ted was sane enough to stand trial and defend himself, but it seemed Judge Burrell had grown tired of the delays. He said that from the start of the trial, Ted was consistently and unequivocally scheming to delay proceedings. Within an hour, it was announced that Ted had agreed to a plea deal. There had always been one on the table, but Ted demanded the right to appeal and to be held in a mental hospital, which the state just couldn't agree to. 
It seemed that Ted was now willing to take those off the table, and he pled guilty to 13 counts for attacks in three states that killed three and injured two. In accordance with this plea bargain, Ted Kaczynski would serve life in prison with no chance of parole, but he was spared the potential death sentence. He was sentenced to serve four life sentences plus 30 years for a campaign of terror that set universities, airliners, and citizens nationwide on edge. Ted had hardly acknowledged his brother and his mother's presence in the courtroom throughout the trial, but as he exited court after sentencing, he ignored them entirely. David Kaczynski saw none of the million dollar reward that he earned for turning in his big brother and one-time idol. Instead, he gave half to the victim's families while using the rest to cover Ted's enormous legal bills that the family had been paying. Once the fear and anxiety of a Unabomber on the loose had subsided, Ted's story proliferated society and pop culture. So, uh, what have you been up to? I've been doing a lot of writing. Yeah, really? <laughs> you, uh, get anything published? Yeah, one thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, where you been living now? I got this great little place up in the woods. It's real secluded and gives me a lot of times to tinker around with my hobbies. From what we've, uh, been led to believe, the, uh, the Unabomber was apparently uh, turned in by his family. They have found something suspicious, some articles, some documents in the old uh, homestead back there in Illinois, really? put two and two together and realized that for the last 17 years, <laughs> the guy who shows up in the hooded sweatshirt and the sunglasses every year for Thanksgiving was, in fact, the Unabomber. Yeah. And just finally, it came to them. Oh, my God, it's the Unabomber. Right. Despite the attempts to ridicule Ted and make light of the situation, his words resonate even to this day with people living in an ever more industrialized and digital world. Many people see his message and philosophies as noble, while condemning his means to accomplish his goals. Yeah. They're sneaking up on us. Yeah. Electronics right. and cars, which is also, you know, it's, an, it's also a creation, a mechanical creation, and now more than ever, they're driving computers. Yeah, man. It's true. What I'm trying to say is Ted Kaczynski was right. Oh my God, we all know that. He was right. Did you ever read his manifesto? No, I'm scared it's catchy. Yeah, man. <laughs> In the end, the hunt for the Unabomber would cost the U.S. taxpayer $50 million, the most expensive investigation in history. The Unabom Task Force would grow to over 150 full-time investigators and analysts that would vet over 50,000 suspects. After his trial, Ted Kaczynski was placed in the federal supermax prison in Florence, Colorado. In 2012, he would receive an invitation to his Harvard graduating class's 50th anniversary reunion. He RSVP'd, noting his occupation as prisoner and his life sentences as awards. After being diagnosed with late-state cancer, he would be transferred to the Federal Medical Center in North Carolina in 2021, a facility that treats prisoners suffering from serious health problems. On June 10, 2023, Ted decided that he was going to go out on his own terms. Emergency workers were called to Ted's cell at 12.23 a.m., where he was found hanging by the neck. Medical Center? Uh-huh. Uh, hey, we got a guy that was hanging, and, you know, in the, in the MS here. What's your telephone number? Uh-huh. How old is he? Um, they didn't give me that information yet. Okay, so is he deceased, or what's going on with him? They're doing this. I guess they got a crash card up there now. So, so what information do you know? Uh, pretty much that's it. All they did was tell me to call you guys and gave me his name. Okay. Yeah. All right, appreciate Sorry, it. brother. It's all right. Attempts to revive Ted there at the prison and in the ambulance were unsuccessful, and he was later pronounced dead at a nearby hospital. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around this long. I know this was uh, one of the more lengthy documentaries I put together here. Let me know in the comments what you think about the philosophies and the ideas of Ted Kaczynski. Obviously, the tactics he used to reach his goal were unacceptable, but do you feel better off for living in an ever more industrialized society? Don't forget to like the video if you liked the video, and subscribe if you want to see more like this. As always, I gotta give love to my patrons who keep this channel afloat. Shane Stangy, Paul B, Brandon Boyson, Caleb Coleman, Spoots McDoug, and Jessica Brianne Teague, Christ Neurosurgeon. And with that, Manic out.